And here I was at 50, going out to start a business as a money coach, found out that spreadsheets don't work, that it's actually in my head. Oh my goodness, maybe I can't do this or uh, can't do this. What do I do? Oh, I know, I'll go and get some training. Signed up with the Money Coaching Institute. Little did I know that I was going to go on the most horrendous journey of learn, having to learn about my relationship with money. Oh, okay. Which turns out it was appalling. Welcome to Our Spirited Life, the broadcast for women who simply won't settle. This season, for the next eight weeks, we're talking about life in our third act, indeed owning our third act. And today, I'm delighted to welcome Fanny Snaith, who's a financial well-being coach, certified money coach, couples money coach, very important, speaker, author, money mentor, motivator and optimist. Welcome, Fanny. And wow, that's quite a list. <laughs> that is quite a list. That is quite a list. Do I do all of those things? No, I guess so. <laughs> and very important they are too, actually. And knowing that you specialise in working with business owners and professionals who appear to be doing well to the outside world, but are secretly struggling financially, and I bet particularly with the year we've all just had, is rather a lot of people, so you are a very important person. Um, I imagine you're much in demand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there is the, the, well, the belief that money is the last taboo, right? That we can't talk about money. Especially in this country, do you think, in Britain? No, I, th I mean, I know that it's about the same in the States, really. I know people think that they like talking about money, but actually I think it's, think it's the same. Do you know where it came from, where we don't talk about money? It came from, it came from way back where the privileged and rich realised that it, they didn't need to talk about money because there was so much inherited wealth that generally people were perceived to be secure. And so therefore there was just no need to talk about money. So they didn't. And it's down through society. Yeah. Was it vulgar to talk about money? Uh, not in my opinion, no. Yeah. No, but it used to be. Yeah. Um, I think it's over the years the beliefs that people have had about talking about money have been self-created and it's all grown into being whatever it is for whoever's thinking about it at the time. But we need to forget about all those myths mm -hmm. because we're living in a society now where we need to talk about money. And the people that need to talk about money the most are the people that need to make sure that they are investing wisely, that they're getting good value for money, and that they're using their money wisely. So it's, you know, it's very important. And that's what I'm, my main message is to open the door to conversation about money. That's a brilliant saying actually, because communication is so important about all sorts of issues. But I think if money is a taboo subject, then it causes all sorts of challenges and, and it's very sad. And actually, I know that you've had experience of that firsthand. So I remember you saying that you were 50 when you decided to become a money coach. Why money and why then? So money, well, money's always been a feature in my life. Mm -hmm. And you know that I love numerology as well. Yes. And when I got to my 50th, funnily enough, I was working in my garage because we just moved house. And I actually felt like I was becoming a mushroom because the garage was <laughs> the garage was um, had only artificial lighting in it. It was cold and it was damp, and I hadn't we hadn't had the extension and this this lovely office been built. And I was, you know, fifty of mid. That was my midlife crisis, right? Thinking, oh my goodness. So I have a lot to thank for that office because it really made me think. What am I doing? I can't do this anymore. Mm. But what shall I, what can I do? I've done this, the same job for the last 13 years, sitting behind two computer screens, really very rarely talking to anybody, but also knowing that I had so much value to give to the world, a good communicator, et cetera. And I went to see um, a career coach 
And we came up with, why don't you be a money coach? Because money has featured so heavily all the way through my life. Is this when I'm supposed to tell my money story? Do you want to hear it? Oh, we'd love to hear your money story. Stories are great. And as you know, I'm all about storytelling. And yeah, because um, I'm sure it will resonate with many. Go ahead. Then. The thing is, is that we all have a money story. And it's very important, I believe, for us all to understand what it is, because it's going to be the thing that has shaped or crafted who we are when it comes to money now as an adult, why we are how we are with money. So my money story, in a nutshell, was my mum was married and divorced three times by the time I was 12. Um, and each one of those marriages was very money driven. So she inherited a lot of money and was a big spender. She'd never been parented and she just liked to spend really. Dad came from more humble beginnings, but he wrote down every single transaction that he made in a book. It was, you know, Wendy spent that, Alan spent that, and it was all written down. Which was, which was the father? First, second or third? Oh no, must have been first. First, yeah. So anyway, when she inherited the money, it just didn't, they just couldn't gel with it at all. It just, it came between them and they divorced. Then mum moved on to her second husband and he wasn't very pleasant. And it, would, it was a good idea, she thought, to get us out of the house um, to avoid the argument. So she packed my sister and I off to boarding school. So I was seven and we arrived at this boarding school in Sunningdale in Berkshire. And what, bearing in mind that I think I had a subconscious view that we came that I came from a wealthy family which we did when I arrived at boarding school I literally as I crossed that threshold I became the pauper because the people in the boarding school were of a much greater wealth than we were so that was interesting spent three years there not really fitting in can't say I didn't enjoy it because I did enjoy a lot of it it was a dance and drama boarding school for a start which was lovely but it was it was strange. I didn't quite fit in and I wasn't. We certainly weren't at the level of wealth. And it does matter. It does matter. You know, it affects you psychologically, emotionally, etc. When people are living a different kind of lifestyle for you. So second husband was put in the bin. That was the end of him. And she'd been spending quite heavily. Uh, there was still quite a lot in the pot, but she was actually quite clever, really, and thought, I'm going to marry my bank manager. So we got a letter at boarding school which said, darlings, everything's going to be fine. I'm going to marry the bank manager. OK, so she did. And all was fine, except that 18 months into the marriage, he found himself in a situation whereby he was being blackmailed um, by a very shady character. Mm -hmm. And he basically gave all our money to this person who was an East End gangster. And she gave, he gave all of our money apart from £76 and all of his mother's money as well. So I had to come out of the boarding school very swiftly. I was only 10 then. We moved from our very nice eight bedroom house into a small damp cottage, but I'm very grateful for that because you know it wasn't exactly, we weren't homeless. Mm. And we moved into the local comprehensive school, the local state school, and joined the free school meals queue. But the interesting thing was, was that the people at the comprehensive school all thought that I was the rich kid, but actually we didn't have a bean. But that was that because of the way you deported yourself and the way you spoke, was it? Yeah, possibly. But I think they also knew I hadn't come from a local primary school, whereas all the other kids were there with their friends and all that kind of stuff. And I was on my own. And yeah, I mean, it's I think, you know, word gets out, doesn't it? And we've got this kid arriving who's been to some posh boarding school sort of thing. And anyway, I remember standing in the free school meals queue. They used to separate us. So they had the paid people on one side and the free school meals on the other side. So we were all standing there on show. And uh, I remember standing there and I remember being the tallest person in the year. I was the youngest, tallest person in the year. So I felt a bit like Big Bird off Sesame Street. Yes. You know, very big and awkward and just, again, not fitting in which was interesting. And I remember saying to myself then, 
I really don't like this. I'm feeling very uncomfortable here. And I felt very angry as well as to what had happened and why I'd ended up where I was. And I made a vow and I said to myself, I will never be beholden to anyone for money ever again. And I'm going to be a millionaire. And that's what I that's what I vowed to do when I was 10 years old. And really, that was my focus for a very long time was to actually just build wealth to become a millionaire. I married a man who had no interest in money whatsoever, which, of course, was my choice because I wasn't going to be beholden to anyone anyway, was I? So I wanted to hold the purse strings and be in control. And when we finally hit the seventh digit on our net worth, which means absolutely nothing, by the way, um, I thought that my life would just change. And I remember saying to him, I said, Neil, Neil, we've hit the million. And he turned and he looked at me and he went, well, it hasn't got anything to do with me, has it? And I thought, oh, my God. And whereas I thought that there were going to be bells and flags and whistles and ooh, all this kind of stuff and everything was going to change, nothing happened. Nothing happened. And we realised that actually we were quite miserable in the fact that we got this wealth, which was only net worth as well. So there was money tied up in property, etc. Sure, there was money in the bank as well. That's how you did it with property. Well, no, it was a bit of both, really. I mean, property and investments starting early, you know, starting early and making the most of time um, and just being prudent and just having a goal and just... It's having the goal. And I think also I love the fact that when you hit the seven figures, you said to Neil, we've, we've made it. Not I've done it, I've done it. So you did embrace and include the fact that it was we as a couple. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah he, he, he obviously had nothing, nothing to, do. to do. So did he find that disempowering that he felt obviously that it was all to do with you? No, not at all. He he was, um, you know, he was just doing his thing, really. He was a um, plumber, heating engineer, just hating his job, always had had, never thought to actually change it. And if he, when we talked about it, he could never really work out what to do. So he was just doing his thing, really. And um, and it, the whole world of finance for him was just like, whoa, I don't, don't, I don't really do that. I was doing all the accounts for his business as well. So he just he just wasn't on that same page. And I later went to find out when I when I became a money coach, which I suppose I've yet to tell your listeners how it happened. But when it when I came to be a money coach and we got the understanding of our money stories together, mm we then could understand why we were, how we were with money. And that then enables a, a whole new relationship. And so now we're very, very, very much more cohesive on, a, on our money journey together. We work together with it. He's managing his own money and he loves it. Right. And so it's a success story. We can talk about money very easily. I rem yeah, I remember you saying, that didn't you spend the first 20 years of your life not being able to talk about money and yeah. you were almost ready to, to, to end it? It wasn't quite that long, but it, it was up until I became a money coach, really. Yeah. But I do remember when I, because I used to work in television before, um, as my first part of my career. And when I had Connie, our first daughter, and I stopped work, I was, had every intention of going back to work. But of course, you look at this, these babies, don't you? And then you have to stay at home. And I remember sitting there trying to craft the question of, was there going to be enough money to pay the bills this month from his wages? That's what I meant. Interestingly, when I look back, you know, we had investments, but there was no way that we were going to touch those because they were going to be part of a million, right? So we had to be self-sustaining as we went through, which, of course, is a very sensible way to think financially. But I remember sitting there thinking, how am I going to ask him if there's going to be enough money to pay the bills without there being heckles, you know, scratchy, without a scratchy conversation? And obviously, it's a real bonus for me now to have learned how to communicate, you know, using the non-violent communication framework, but that's another story. So anyway, yeah. got to my 50th, was really gone past the million bit and thinking, well, what am I going to do now? I called myself the rudderless millionaire for a little bit because I had my, my goal had been met and I didn't know what else to do. And I felt lost. And it just so happened that my 50th came along. I was sitting in a cold, damp garage with no lights. And it was like, 
that's it. I've got to do something different. And of course, of course, all my friends had asked me, they go, Fanny, can you help me with my finances? Can you help me sort this out? What should I do here? You know, should I open this, this, that, and the other? And I just thought, well, why don't I try and do it for a living? So I started off literally just putting spreadsheets up. Okay, come over, I'll show you all my spreadsheets. And they would come down, they'd look at them and they would just glaze over or cry. And it suddenly dawned on me then that money isn't about figures and spreadsheets. It's about mainly how we feel about it emotionally in our hearts. Yes, and our money stories. This is it. You don't teach people how to make money. You teach people how to manage their money almost from an emotional point of view because you understand that there's a story behind their own money story. Yes, but also you say I don't help people make money. That's not quite correct because actually the emotions around our money can very very often in fact extremely often really well especially women going in starting a new career at 50 those money stories can hold us back yes from actually going out and asking for money and asking for asking for business yes because of the feelings of self-worth i'm not good enough i mean along with you know possibly hitting menopause that critical time at the age of 50, which is of course what I did. So I'd been paid a salary. I'd never, never applied for a job in my life before. Every job I had had always been handed to me on a plate for which I was eternally grateful. And here I was at 50, going out to start a business as a money coach, found out that spreadsheets don't work, that it's actually in my head. Oh my goodness, maybe I can't do this or uh, can't do this. What do I do? Oh, I know, I'll go and get some training. Signed up with the Money Coaching Institute. Little did I know that I was going to go on the most horrendous journey of learn, having to learn about my relationship with money. Oh, okay. Which turns out it was appalling. <laughs> and the relationship I had with my husband. Well, that's the same as psych psychotherapists, isn't it? They have to go through their story before they can really, be, they have to face up to everything. And so that's really fascinating. Um, so Fanny, what do you think are the advantages and perhaps the disadvantages of something starting something new later in life, which is exactly what you did? The advantages are clearly you've got so much more experience in life. You have skills and abilities across a whole range of area whole loads of areas which you can put into practice you've hopefully possibly got a bit of money behind you because it takes money to invest in business as you well know and it's exciting and we need a third chapter mm. or a third act we you know it's time for us to go and do something else you know my two children now are 16 and 19 I mean, I'm 56 now, um, so part of, I had children quite late, so part of my 50s was still very much looking after the girls, but I'm freer now. Uh, so it's time for us, really, if we have been a parent. Actually, I love that. Yes, our third act is really our time, isn't it? I love that, yeah. And our values, which obviously I think, well, I think are the most important things I never really realised it when I was younger, and you know, a lot of talk now about values. What you know, what are your values? I, mean, well, I don't know. What are my values? But actually, if you think about your values, they change as you go through your life. I mean, if you think about it, when you're a 16-year-old or nine, let's say you better make it legal. Let's say you're 18. Your values are going to be going out, partying, yes. boys, yes. right, sex holidays, dancing. Yeah, those are going to be your values. When you get to, say, your 30s, you're going, your values are going to change again. It might be thinking about family, putting down some roots, you know, maybe earlier. And then when you get to your 40s, you probably have that, what that what you call is your midlife crisis. I think 40s are sort of paled into insignificance now, really. It's definitely yeah. moved up to 50s. And then when you get to your 50s, your values change again. And my values are... This is my third act. Let's use that phrase because it's beautiful. What do I want to achieve now? 
before we snuff out the candle. Yes. Do you think it's partly, it's, we're ready to give back, aren't we? Do you think that's partly what the third act is about? Do you know, I don't know about that. I might have to, I might have to, I might have to be a bit controversial and go, no, do you know what? I'm going to take as well. I'm going to give back, obviously, by the time. I think, yeah, this is my time, but we are able, in some respects, in a way, this um, Our Spirited Life broadcast is, I want to share some of the things that I've learned, that my dear friends have learned, that my connections have learned. And I want to be able to share that and that this is what this is about. So who are your typical clients and why do they come to you? I generally coach in three different ways. Individuals, which is one-to-one -one coaching, which is for the person who feels that money is holding them back. Mm -hmm. It may be that they say, if I have money, this will happen. If uh, there was only that, if, the, if, if I was different financially, that would happen. They might be saying, I'm rubbish with money or, you know, just really believing that there's something going on in here that is stopping them doing the, doing the practical bit. Yeah. There's no doubt that managing your money on a practical level is one of the most empowering things that you can learn. Oh. And it's so easy. It, what do they say? Um, um, oh, actually, that's not really true. I was going to say a minute to learn and a lifetime to master. It's not, it's a minute to master, really, but sometimes it can take a lifetime to learn how to learn it because you've got all of these obstacles in your brain that's stopping you do it. I mean, I'm working with people who have got masters, degrees, PhDs, and yet they're not managing their money. It's not their ability, it's how they feel about it. And it's their emotions around it. Yeah. Their, you know, feelings that they can't do it. Yeah. And the messages we give ourselves and it's self-talk around money that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy or the message that we give to the universe, you know, and so it's the law of attraction, it's all of these things. So yeah. the fact that you are a money coach and you tackle the fundamental issues around our feelings about money is absolutely brilliant, funny. Let me tell you about the couples, yes. because that's such a lovely piece of work that I do. Mm. It's so nice to have a couple who come along who really love each other, but the one sticking thing, sticking point between them is money. And especially when they've got into their 50s, they've got a little bit older, and it's sort of like, you know, oh, everything's okay, but we just put up with that bit. You don't need to put up with that bit. If you think about couples money coaching, you can really get some real depth of understanding about what the other person understands, beliefs, feels around money. And that can actually catapult your relationship into a whole new realm. Because there's no doubt that if you can create some financial intimacy, you know what they say, financial intimacy, and the rest comes along sort of naturally. You know what I mean? I don't know that I've ever heard the term financial yeah. intimacy. Well, that makes sense, though. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. And then for I also run a group programme, which is mainly for women, I have to say. it's not. I don't market it for women, but I tend to get women called Loving Me, Loving My Money. Oh. It's a small group, and it's really for money avoiders, people who want to get back on track with money, people who want to be in a group and learn money together. And it's really, it's 90 days to becoming an excellent money manager okay. by loving yourself and loving your money. And it's a mixture of videos and stuff online and live sessions with me on Zoom in a small group. It's great. So you wouldn't say that it's ever too late. Do you think learning is for life? It's never too late to learn something new, do you think? I, I'm a lifelong learner. I'm a lifelong learner. And, you know, when it comes to money, I mean, I don't know everything. I read, I still read, I've got a whole shelf of money books and I still don't know everything. I'm, you know, reading a fantastic money book yeah. at the moment, which is for, you know, anybody can read it. And it's, I learn loads of stuff from it. And what about um, young people? Because these days, do you think it's even harder for the youngsters than it, you know, for our daughters or our sons, our children, our grandchildren? Do you think it's harder for them in this day and age where perhaps, well, a job certainly isn't for life. You don't swan off with a gold 
watch when you retire, things are very, very different. Do you think they're tougher? Or do you think there's no glass ceiling? And so we can um, really apply ourselves and do what we feel we want to do. Well, it's really interesting because I work with a lot of young people. Being the business um, advisor for the young enterprise at the local school, the young enterprise is a national scheme whereby uh, six formers, they form a company, about a group of about 15, 12 of them, form a company, and then they have to design and uh, design a product and take it to market. And um, we've been in the national finals for the last two years. So I see very driven young people. And it's very easy to paint a picture of young people in a bad way, but oh my goodness, the talent that is out there now. As far as coming to managing money and getting on top of money, you, what I see, what I think I see is a divide in the fact that those who are jumping on to the personal development, I can be, I create my life, train, there is no ceiling for them whatsoever. They, they, there has never been a better time to earn money. There has never been a better time to be able to create side hustles and also manage your money easily because there are so many apps, etc., out there. And with it being digital, people say, oh, there isn't it hard for people because it's digital? Well, no, not really if that's their normal. I mean, my daughters, we, we can't, when we're not using cash now, really in 2020, it's literally becoming very difficult to use. That's their normal, right? They, that's what, it's only because us oldies think that, oh, you can't do it as well without money, it's not tangible. It's only because that's what we were brought up with. But they find it normal, really. So your answer to your question, it's tougher in some ways in the fact that things are a lot more expensive um and to try and get on the property ladder you know there's no doubt that property is ridiculously expensive compared to the average salary etc however there are lots of opportunities as well yeah and i think the main thing that's the bugbear for me is that school needs to catch up and actually get a grip and start teaching people about personal finance and business finance at school at school life skills Yes, life skills, finance, because if you are not in control of your finance, uh, the peace of mind isn't necessarily there unless you've got your head in the sand. So it's life skills, and I think that we would do our school leavers a favour to keep them on for an extra eight weeks, and perhaps the schools may say, this is not our responsibility, um, but they seem to be put upon for all sorts of things, and just to have, even if people like you go in, Fanny, and teach them financial skills, you know, we can have people teaching them nutrition and just fundamental skills of life, and then, you know, send them out there, because sometimes they've got nothing else to do. They go to, to nothing. What do they think they're going to, to be doing? So they've got time to learn these things. And I think your financial intimacy and the fact that the emotional story behind finances, it's all so important. It's not just spreadsheets, because I'm not, I'm a creative and I'm a visual. So I look at a, a list of numbers and my brain just switches off. Now I can apply myself to learning that, but I'm very excited to learn more, particularly about the loving me, loving my money, because that speaks volumes to me. Because if you don't love yourself and love your money, you're going to perhaps potentially get into big, big trouble or not do the best that you can do with your life and with your resources. It's interesting, Susie, because when you say you're a visual person, and I mean, that's so important. I remember sitting down with a certain young lady um, who is very close to your heart, who is also a visual person, and I remember that we were we were talking about budgeting. We were having a we were having a, a money session, and you know there's a way that we can do this for everybody. And I remember rather than writing lists of that's the gas bill, that's this, that's this, that's this, we just drew circles all over the page, and then we linked it to the bank account, and then you can make circles different colours for money coming in and money going out. So there's always a way 
there's always a way to help somebody Send engage the with money. Yeah. yeah. One of the biggest challenges, or one of the challenges that I think people don't pay attention to, is where is money and finance on your list of values? Because and I understand that it, you know, money's at the top of my values, right? Which is great, along with family and teaching and learning and all that kind of stuff, which thank you very much. That suits me very nicely. But for many who are working in a job or retired or whatever, money might not be at the top of the list of their values. Or even in the top five, I think is the most important thing. And if it isn't, then the chances are you're not going to be wealthy because it's like anything else. If your health isn't on the top, in your top five list of values, the chances are you're not going to be very healthy because you're not paying attention to it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you ignore it, oh gosh, I totally agree, Fanny. Yeah. So my job, and this could be, you know, my job is to listen to somebody whose money is where money isn't in their top five list of values listen to them understand their values understand what's important to them and then somehow try and connect finance to that which sounds obvious right because let's say somebody's got a penchant for sailing sailing costs money so have more money look after your money better you get to do more sailing it sounds obvious but people don't tend to connect the two it's that freedom of choice isn't it money does give you choices yeah. and it does on having you know money allows you to be not necessarily happier because that's another story in another state of mind but it makes you more comfortable and it gives you it just does give you choices and it's up to you to learn how to make wise choices yeah um, and happiness is only, only a temporary state right it's only happiness is only it's just an emotion that comes and goes what we're after is feeling fulfilled mm, yes and, yes and, and peace of mind sorry and peace of mind yeah that's right peace of mind when you put your head on the pillow at night you feel fulfilled and contented and you have that peace of mind you're absolutely right money is an essential part of our fulfillment we can't deny it because we you know Last I looked, health, roof over your head, clothes, light, water, everything. It all costs money. Yeah. You know, you can, you can walk around your house and count the little red standby lights you've got looking at you. It's all you're spending money even when you don't even think about it, right? And so it's the fundamentalness of money, isn't it, of finance, the, the fundamental elements of finance that are key to so many areas in our life. And I, I just also believe that it is never too late. You know, I'm well into my third act now and I still have great intention to uh, build the kind of life that I truly desire. Um, and I don't see anything wrong with that. I have ambition, I have goals. Um, and, and one of those is to do your Loving Me, Loving My Money course because I know that's going to help me along the way. Um, Anything else that you would like to add before I ask you about, well, let's let's go on to, have you got three top tips for our audience to take away or one major takeaway that you would just like them to focus on? What it, I would say is, if you're starting a business, if you're wanting to live your third act by providing a service for people, get on board with the money as quickly as possible because if you you've all heard the saying i'm sure where focus goes energy flows and i hear time and time again in my money course that when i mean it's lovely a good one lady said do you know i'm really getting the hang of this money lark and this is actually quite fun i'm actually quite enjoying looking at my money and isn't it weird how i've got three new clients this week and that seems to happen again and again that I hear. So I'm sort of thinking there must be, there's definitely that link. So get on board with the money. Um, if you're going to start a business and 
give a service out there. Be ready for a knock in your self-worth, possibly. And don't worry about it. Uh, embrace it. Dance with it. Because I, I know I spent too long after I gave up my job. I mean, honestly, Susie, I gave up my job where I'd had a salary coming in every month for 13 years. And all of a sudden, here I am, supposed to be this amazing money coach, which I wasn't, by the way, until I'd gone to the Money Coaching Institute. And all of a sudden I had to go, oh, come and listen to Fanny Snape. Come and listen to me. I'm doing this. And I was like, oh, I don't, you know, I'm feeling frightened and I don't know what to do. And I spent far too much time holding myself back because I felt that I wasn't good enough to do what I was doing. And as a woman, at 50, it can be at the most vulnerable time in your life too, because you're, all your hormones are going round and round in circles and it can be very difficult. I'm gonna let you into a secret actually. Last year, well into the menopause, I got to a point, I thought I was going mad. I honestly thought I was going mad. I couldn't focus on anything. I was thinking, you know, I, I, um, I wasn't interested in my business. I was thinking, I'm a rubbish money coach. I don't want to do this anymore. This is too hard. This is too difficult. I'm, I'm, nobody values my services. Nobody's looking at my posts on social media. It was all gloom and doom and doom. And I literally, I went to bed, basically. But I really thought that it was the business that was doing it to me. But actually, when I thought about it, it was, it was the menopause. So do you know what I did? Yeah. I, went and go, I went off and got a job in Sainsbury's. So this time last year, I had just started work. I was just about to start working in Sainsbury's behind the till because I needed to do something which was just going to stabilise me. It was the best decision I ever made. And it was a really, a really interesting experiment as well, a money coach working in Sainsbury's. By the way, in the same Sainsbury's that was near the school that my daughter went to, which was a private school. So they were seeing me working in Sainsbury's. The psychology of it, fascinating. All the mums coming in going, oh, you're working here now. I thought you were a money coach. And I go, yeah, I am. Anyway, that's another story. But give... Keep an eye on yourself. Keep an eye on yourself. Be observant as to the fears that you have. Yes. yes. But, but I, I think, think that's, that's you, you, Fanny. Fanny. You, you take, take the, the fright, fright and the fear, fear out of finance, finance and put the, put the fun, fun back, back into, into it. Because... I like that. I should have written, written that down. All, all too often, we're frightened of money. You know, it's something that is... Scary. I remember you saying to me, Susie, money is not something to put on the naughty step. You know, it's your friend. Money is your friend. And I loved your phrase, your description is that every pound is a foot soldier. So every pound that you don't spend, you think, oh, that's only a fiver. I can get that. That's five foot soldiers. And so by not just getting that frippery, You've got five foot soldiers and all your foot soldiers eventually build up into an army to protect you. And actually that analogy really worked for me. So Not only protect you, but also to fight for you, for you to be able to invest in stuff in your business, for you to invest in yourself as well, yeah. to use wisely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but it, it, this is it, money. I see so many people's relationship with money where they just... They just don't like it. And it's a real shame because, like I said, we live with it 24-7. And you might as well get on with it. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic, Fanny. Thank you. I would like to ask you if you have, because I also, it's investing in ourselves and the power of music for me is something that is with me daily. And I know that music has the power to change our mood. And so I'd like to leave our listeners with a top tip of a piece of music that um, uplifts or inspires um, my um, guests to, uh, to just feel fantastic. And I have to just pop in here that one of mine, and I was only thinking about it last night, is Gloria Gaynor's um, I Am What I Am. And 
10 minutes before we were due to start our recording this broadcast, um, Radio 2 put on that very song. So I ramped the volume up and had a bit of a dance around the room and thanked the universe because I thought, what a great sign. Because that's, I am what I am and I'm doing this um, in order to, to, to help all of us in our third act. So what's your piece of music that you feel just gets those, those juices flowing? Am I allowed to have two? Yes, of course you are. Okay, so first of all, I have to tell you that I Am What I Am is my karaoke star piece. Okay, <laughs> okay. Fine. Just like just like to say that. That's the one that when I do karaoke, people always go, damn, mum, that was great. Yeah. Well, when we're, when we're out of lockdown, um, because we're recording this during lockdown, I'm going to come and watch you and maybe even sing along with you on that karaoke. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> so I've got two, which... I know it's a bit cheaty, but for uplift, yeah. for uplift, it's got to be This Will Be by Natalie Cole, which was released in 1975. Um, it was one of the first singles that I ever bought behind Puppy Love by Donny Osmond and, their, and 48 Crash by Susie Quattro. Okay. And it was Natalie Cole, This Will Be. You'll have to look it up. But I challenge you that if you play it at a reasonably decent volume, not to get invigorated and inspired. Great. That's what we want. Right. But the second one, which is, I think, probably my all time favourite. And actually, don't I want this to be played at my funeral, okay. which for me, I have no fear of death whatsoever. As far as I'm concerned, I will be passing on to another life and learning the lessons that I didn't learn in this life yeah. as I'm here to learn the lessons that I didn't learn in the last life while I'm here and my track is another track which you probably won't know but it's I challenge you again to go and I request okay. that you go and listen to it with an open heart and it's called Zoom and it's by the Commodores oh I do know that one yes and what the reason I like it is because there's one verse in it I've actually got the lyrics here so I don't mess it up but it says, I wish the world were truly happy, living as one. I wish the world they call freedom someday would come. And it's like there's just that the whole ooziness of Lionel Richie mm. and the Commodores behind it. And the, just that song is just, mm. I love it. And both my daughters, both my daughters play it in secret. Oh, fabulous. So I know they like it too. Fanny, that's absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for being my guest today. It's been an absolute joy. And I would just like to say to our audience that if you love what's happening here, press subscribe. And also we're setting up, a, uh, there is set up a private Facebook group for you to join with lots of added value. And so there will be details of how to join that um, alongside this broadcast and um, once again Fanny thank you so much because the whole point about this is share and share and help people um, live a fabulous third act so you're wonderful darling thank you so thank much thank you so much for the opportunity Susie as ever thank you take care and everybody stay fun stay fabulous and go and check out Fanny's wonderful financial fun and freedom take care if you enjoyed this broadcast, please remember to like and subscribe. And to enjoy fabulous extra value, just click the link to our membership page. <laughs>